Hi folks, welcome to this video on physiological aids. So you might have seen the one pharmacological aids. Pharmacological aids were substances that boosted or increased the amount of naturally occurring hormones or neurotransmitters in your body, such as anabolics to boost testosterone. Physiological aids, these are strategies and or substances used to speed up the rate of adaptation, help your body adapt and or recover, if you want to go that way, quicker. Now, I put one in red and then two in blue. The reason being is when we looked at pharmacological aids, all three of those were illegal substances. Blood doping of these three is the only illegal one, hence why I put it in red. The two legal things that you can do, you will not get banned for doing, is IHT, intermittent hypoxic training, and the use of cooling aids. But again, each one has its pros, each one has its cons, regardless of it being legal or illegal. So we're going to look at each one now very quickly. Right, so blood doping, where have you seen these points before? You've seen these exact same points when we looked at EPO on pharmacological aids. When you injected EPO, that stimulated the production of red blood cells and haemoglobin, which increased your oxygen carrying capacity and therefore ultimately increased the intensity and the duration of any endurance-based performance. This is, if you think of it, the father, the godfather, grandfather, whatever it is, of EPO. This is what was done probably back in the day, but it's still done now by athletes. This blood bag, I could take a pint of your blood out now and then put it into freeze. Within four to six weeks, your body will have remade that pint of blood. Hence why we can donate blood. We can donate a pint of blood and it doesn't cause any problems because we can remake that pint that we've donated. However, what we then do is we then take the blood that, you, that we took out of you a few weeks ago, put a freeze and we extract the red blood cells and inject them back into your system. So we haven't had to inject EPO, but we've had to go through a quite a bit of a faff to get the red blood cells back into you. But the advantage to this strategy is there's no illegal substance there to trace. It's just your it's your red blood cells that have gone back into your system. It's very difficult to detect and very difficult to find, but it does speed up the rate of adaptation of the body. You will get those adaptations as we've seen with EPO. But why is it different to EPO? We're not injecting anything that boosts the amount of a natural substance. We are just injecting, re-injecting the natural substance back into you. The haemoglobin that we've extracted, you know, a month, six weeks prior. So as you might have deduced already, if it's got the same benefits as injecting EPO, it's also going to have a lot of the same downsides as well. By having more haemoglobin back in the blood, your blood, blood viscosity, excuse me, is going to increase again. We're going to have an increased risk of blood clots and heart failure as a result of that. And again, we're going to have decreased cardiac output because our blood is thicker, harder to eject from the heart. Um, but one that's unique to this is because we are re-injecting the blood, or we're taking the blood out of you, and then we're re-injecting it back into you several weeks later, there's a risk of transfusion infections and reactions. We could get, see hepatitis, we could see HIV, particularly if the needles are not sterile. The needles' chances are won't be sterile because this is an illegal practice. You can't go to your doctor to get this done. There's an increased risk of sharing of needles in order to achieve this, and that ultimately increases this risk of infections. Right, intermittent hypoxic training, IHT. These fellas in this picture are undergoing IHT. You've probably all heard about altitude training. So you go up, altitude is technically 2,000 metres above sea level, and you train there for usually 30 days minimum is what's recommended. Now, obviously, going to altitude, it costs a lot of money. It's time away from your family. And there's also issues of um, altitude sickness. So you spend all that money to get to altitude. And as soon as you get there, you feel awful. Why? What do we find at altitude? We find oxygen levels approximately half that of what you will find at sea level. So the air that you're breathing in right now at sea level is around about 21% oxygen. So when we go to altitude, we're looking at around about 10% of the, of the air that you're breathing in is oxygen. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to go to that environment? Well, what it does is it stimulates the production of more red blood cells, more haemoglobin, as we've written down here. Um, this is what IHT is going to do as well, because your body is that desperate to grab every molecule of oxygen out of the atmosphere. It's, it's only choices to produce more haemoglobin in order to do that. So that when you then return to sea level, you've got a lot more haemoglobin. You're getting the exact same effects here, but this is legal because as you can see, these boys are training hard. They're not cheating. Whereas here, you're just re-injecting some of your haemoglobin that's been taken out of you originally. However, 
altitude training, very expensive, time away from your family. So what's been developed is this method instead. These boys are training at sea level. They're on bikes in their local gym, probably. But these masks that they're breathing into, okay, and these bags, they are reducing the air that's going into their lungs by half. So they are breathing in the amount of oxygen that they would experience at, at altitude. So they're living and training at sea level, but they are actually, in theory, training at altitude because of, of uh, the amount of oxygen that's going into their system. The word that's used is hypoxic. Hypo meaning low levels of. So intermittent hypoxic training, you are doing, um, you are doing work where there's low levels of oxygen. Typically, that would be altitude, but we can recreate the altitude conditions using these masks here. So you're getting all the benefits of altitude training without the cost, without the time away from your family, without the altitude sickness that you would normally experience just by living at altitude. So that explains the hypoxic part. What about this intermittent thing? Well, what are these boys are doing here? Well, don't know exactly, but they're probably doing something like a 500 meter maximal bike ride, you know, trying to work as hard as they can. It might even be two or three minutes, high intensity bike ride, or, you know, with a high resistance, something like that, whilst they are only receiving about 10% oxygen through the masks. What they then do is when they get into their rest period, they will take the mask off. So they're breathing in normal oxygen and then they will then put the mask on again for set number two. Take the mask off again for their next recovery set and then put the mask on again for set number three. So they're doing periods. It's basically interval training, but we use the word intermittent here. Interval training with the mask on during the exercise periods and off during the recovery periods. So the benefit of doing this, as I said, you then don't have to acclimatise for altitude events. If you've got a World Cup or an Olympics that is held at a country altitude, if you train like this beforehand, you're all ready for the altitude conditions. It's going to increase the red blood cells. As we've said, lower oxygen levels means that your body will produce more haemoglobin to try and capture as much oxygen as possible. As a result of these increased red blood cells, I'm going to be able to carry more oxygen and it's also going to allow me to delay fatigue. Something that oxygen also does is it also removes lactic acid from your muscles. So that burning sensation when you've been working hard at high intensity, if I can get more oxygen into the muscles, I'll be able to remove or buffer that lactic acid more effectively. So the negatives, the downsides then, well, it's one of those when people do conventional altitude training, when they come back down to sea level, they start to lose the effects of it pretty much straight away. So, you know, the, that increased hemoglobin that you've made will start to disappear as soon, you know, pretty much as soon as you return to sea level. The same with this, as soon as you stop IHT, you're going to start losing the benefits. So that's, you know, you start, in other words, you've got to keep using IHT right up until your event. Uh, and that can be quite tough. Because you're only breathing in up to about 10% normal oxygen, 10% oxygen, which is half what you normally would do, it's very difficult to work at your usual intensity. So some people say, is it actually worth it in the long run? Because I can't work. Isn't it just better to work a lot harder with more oxygen? So, you know, it, it can come down to individual preference. With altitude, or, you know, recreating these altitude conditions, we have decreased immune system function. So we're more prone to infections as well. So you train harder, and then ultimately you increase your chance of picking up a flu or a bug or a virus or something like that. And we also notice that dehydration also increases a hell of a lot. So, you know, it's not all pluses. It is a, there are many side effects and you've got to weigh up whether it's effective for your athlete to use or not. So finally, cooling aids then. As you can see, I've had to cram it in a little bit. I apologise for that. Because there are three main types of cooling aids. This lady here is wearing what's called an ice vest. Now, these are generally used before competition. So let's say you're exercising in a very warm, hot humid environment. You're going to lose a lot of fluid through sweating. You're going to get dehydrated very early. So what we do is we put this vest on you that's got ice cold water pumping through it. That's going to reduce your body temperature before the event. Um, and we can wear them for up to 10 to 30 minutes at a time before the event. So it's going to reduce our sweating, our dizziness, our dehydration before the event. So in theory, we can last longer during the event we haven't uh, lost as much fluid or raised our temperature as high just before the event. 
And during the event, during any sports we play, we might make use of another cooling aid, much more common one, ice packs. Every time you get knocked, every time you have an injury, you apply an ice pack to the injury site. Ice is a natural analgesic. It kills pain by um, reducing, uh, or, you know, by basically numbing the nerve endings at the injury site. But also, it causes blood flow to the injury site to reduce. You constrict your blood vessels going to the injury. So that's going to reduce swelling and bruising. Um, so that's massively beneficial. And finally, post-event, after the event, we can use ice baths. And you may have seen these, you may have even had these before. So you plummet your body, you can be waist high, you can be neck high, into a big bucket of cold water with ice in it. Now this speeds up the removal of waste products such as a lactic acid. How does it do this? I'll put a very, very abbreviated version down. But just think about it, when you get into ice cold water, your body constricts all of your major blood vessels, i.e. they narrow up, because your body wants to keep all the warm blood close to your core, close to your brain, your heart, your lungs, and keep you alive, because the temperature is so cold. When you then get out of the ice bath, your body flushes oxygen-rich blood to all the areas that were very, very cold. So your extremities, your limbs, your arms, your legs, things like that. And as that oxygen-rich blood flows through your muscles, it flushes out all the toxins and it gets rid of all the lactic acid. So that's how it works. Actually being in the ice bath doesn't actually get rid of any toxins. What you're doing is getting the, the temperature so cold that when you get out the ice bath, you flush warm blood throughout your entire body and that flushes the toxins out of the muscles. So finally on the inevitable downsides, well, you know, you can get ice burns and you can get severe pains by being in this water. A lot of people just don't refuse to have ice baths because of the pain. I've had one before. I did a London Marathon years ago. And I thought, I'll try it out because my legs are in bits 24 hours afterwards. It was hideous. It was absolutely hideous. It was, you know, unbearable uh, to a point. Um, so, you know, there are issues surrounding that. Because we're using ice to numb nerve endings and reduce pain, it can hide or complicate injuries, which obviously isn't a good thing because then athlete could continue to play on an injury and ultimately make it worse or complicate it as we've put down there. And also these conditions where we're making massive changes to, to uh, body temperature and core body temperature is dangerous for the elderly people who can't, aren't as efficient at controlling core temperature as younger people. And it's also very dangerous for people who've got heart conditions because they're suddenly when you, you and your blood vessels all constrict and then dilate, that is massively changing your blood pressure over a very short period of time. And that can have die consequences for those with heart conditions. So we've got to be careful when we use uh, certain types of cooling aids. So these are all physiological aids. Hope you found this video useful, folks.